Hello, well, thanks a lot for being here. That's the biggest turnout so far. So I'm on Tommy. This is an informal discussion, right? So this is why we're like like this. Feel free to ask questions anytime. This is not a person demonstrating knowledge or something else. It's about you learning a few things. She's done more than we've done here. She's doing things, campaigns, everything else. She knows stuff. So we're here to ask her questions and have this question, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm Tommy. Uh, this is Dark Music Talks. Um, basically, I'm a musician myself and doing a little bit of marketing as well. But because I saw that nobody really cares about what musicians know and nobody strives to, to give them some education except if you're in a music college. I said, all right, I'm going to talk to some experts that know things and bring them to come and talk to musicians that want to learn. And this is how it started in January, in a, in a rainy afternoon in Leicester as well. 18 people came, I think it was just a minute. Yeah, there isn't one person that was in the first one. And since then we started growing. But the important part is we kept the discussion going. It was a discussion, it was not a lecture, right? So, I'm one of you, we're all the same, we all care about music, we do it here because you want to learn things, so it's about the discussion. That was it. We're going to do one every month, at least one, so you will receive emails about what's happening and everything else. Don't put it in spam folders or anything else. Um, so, this is what this is all about, and we're lucky, normally we facilitate the event in another place. Uh, around Victoria uh, tube station, but now we're here in Barbican because we're part of Hack the Barbican, which is basically um, the whole month of August that will refurbish all the big, the big venues, so they give all the public spaces to creative individuals to make collaborations, projects, whatever. So that was the right place at the right time, and here we are in Barbican. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, don't video tape me. Don't put it in YouTube. Um, hope you enjoy it, ask questions, it's all about being creative, but let's start. Hello? Yeah. That sounds like a good evening. Brilliant. Okay, my name is JC Schooler. Uh, we're going to start off my talk. Um, as Tommy said, let's make it as informal as we need. Uh, you might notice here on the title we've got a couple of hashtags, darker music talks, and direct to fan. Feel free to use those should you decide to tweet or uh, post a about today. Okay, so starting off, who am I? Jesse School is my name. I am the director of an agency called Wixdeep Works, and we specialise in direct to fan. Uh, I come from a town called Monganui in New Zealand. Uh, you may have noticed my accent, I'm told that I have one. I've been in London for six years trying to shake that accent. Uh, but my background is in music licensing, uh, artist management, and in law before that. Um, and most recently, uh, before starting my own agency, I worked with a company called Tops and Media, which some of you might be, might be familiar with. This is uncool. <laughs> Bear with me. Right. So now I know who I am and how good I am at fixing my neck. Tell me, I want to know uh, who you guys are. Uh, can you please put your hand up if you're a musician? Cool. There's a lot of musicians in the room. It's great. Um, if you're an artist manager, cool. A few of those. And who hasn't put their hand up? Put your hand up now. Okay, you go through. Different kind of music industry folk from guessing. That's cool, thanks for that. Alright, so you finished your album, addressing the artists in the room, um, or you're close to finishing it and you're starting to plan for your release. First and only question do you have a network of supporters um, with whom you can communicate your activities? Before you come anywhere near to selling, whether it's your album, uh, merchandise, or tickets, uh, you need to ensure that you have a network of fans and basically a market to sell to. Nobody wants to be playing to an empty room. So 
the best saving you can do for yourself and your career is to plan your launch, plan your lead time that is the months leading up to your release date. And make the time to connect with your fans first. Okay, so I'm going to run through the topics we're going to look at in the next 30 to 40 minutes. We're going to look at uh, what is direct to fan. We'll touch on an album launch timeline. We're going to run through a best practice data capture process. Uh, we're going to go through an album pre-sale structure and we're going to finish with a discussion on how you might go about keeping your fans engaged. Uh, if I use any jargon that you're not familiar with, please do stop me. Ask me what if that means. Um, questions? Let's take those as they come. Okay, so let's take a, maybe start by having a step back and look at what exactly I mean when I talk about director fan. Now, the first thing I want to point out about director fan is that this is not a new concept. Our mailing lists, fan clubs, these have existed pretty much for the whole time we've had an entertainment industry. What is new is the means of accessing your fans via software platforms and the internet. So the director fan platforms, uh, the new, newly accessible platforms, are really what's giving director fan as a channel its growth in uh, today's market. So what is director fan? This is a way for us to make extra money from selling their stuff. Um, for example, the average transaction on iTunes, you're looking at around two to three pounds. But with direct fan transactions, the average is actually closer to 22 pounds. Quite a big difference. Uh, direct fan provides a platform for artists to build a relationship directly with their fans. And uh, it sits along other channels, so um, HMB, Amazon, iTunes, those sort of traditional ways to market. So if we look at direct fan uh, as an additional sales channel, um, what we can have is retail campaigns running alongside, uh, maintain strong relations with your digital and your traditional retail partners, and at the same time build yourself up a strong direct fan business. So how is the big question, I think, at this point. Uh, there's three ways we look at. We've got uh, engaging, connecting, and uh, offering something special and giving your fans a reason to buy from you. Uh, so if we look at each of these in a little more detail, we start with the online presence. The director fan, making sure that your website, your social media profiles, any other touch points online are ship shape and uh, exactly the way they should be in the best possible working order, that's the first thing. And this can include uh, using data capture widgets, uh, which exchange digital content for an email address. Jargon alert. Does anyone know what I mean when I say widget? Nobody. Yeah, Facebook apps. That's, yeah, that's a good point. Okay. When we talk about widgets, I think back to my um, fifth form economics class where widgets were a meaningless term for a commodity that your companies were buying and selling. But nowadays, um, like you say, it's, it's kind of a casual term which refers to a piece of embeddable or shareable content. So something like an email sign-up form or a streaming player for all your video. Something that you can take a code for and put, put elsewhere on your website, on other websites. Okay, the second how is connect. Um, every artist has a unique voice, and the key is in finding that voice, the voice which will resonate with your fans, the same way that your music resonates with your fans. But getting fans onto your email list is the hardest thing, and then keeping them there, well, that's the next hardest thing. Um, and the artist really has to find the balance of communication and keeping fans interested, but not overwhelming them or boring them. So artists using direct to fan can start a conversation um, and let fans see inside the creative process uh, just as much or as little as they're comfortable with. So this could be for some artists uh, like a, an ad hoc video from behind the scenes at the recording studio. Uh, maybe it's a tweet about what's on the writer we did tonight. Um, or something a little more enigmatic like an obscure Instagram photo. The goal here is to create a relationship of trust and loyalty. Something like a tribe. And in that way, your fans may choose to take on your message and to share it, and effectively to become your co-marketers. Okay, the third how is to give fans a reason to spend their money. And we do this by offering something special, something compelling. 
and this could be something high quality, exclusive, uh, limited edition, numbered, signed. Uh, for example, this is the deluxe offer from uh, 30 Seconds to Mars recent preset. Now it includes all these items, so we've got here a t-shirt, poster, drumsticks, picks, and guitar picks, vinyl, I don't even know what all these things are. Uh, it also included a thank you phone call from the band. So this is, this is the deluxe offer. Has anyone got some guesses for me about how much the price tag is on this one? Was that? 69 Okay. Anyone else have a guess? More guesses. 300. 300. 300, okay. That's a 20. This one retail at um, $50,000. This is a man, right? I mean, it is. So that's around 650 pounds. Uh, I'm not suggesting you guys put 650 pound offers on your pre-sale, but um, this is an example of what's out there in the market today. And we're going to take a look at how you're going to structure your offers and what you're going to price them at a bit later. Okay, so once your sales are done, um, besides building this lasting relationship with the fans and making extra money, uh, what you're left with, uh, if that's enough, is a whole lot of data. And this is data that you just don't get through the traditional retail channels. So uh, just imagine I'm an artist, um, I have my album stocked with iTunes, with H&B, which is where the record stores are still going. Um, a fan comes to the store and buys this record, that's great, I get some royalties, hopefully, eventually. Uh, but what I don't get, what I'm missing out here on, um, is the chance to actually follow up with that fan and engage with them. Tell them about my next album, tell them about some remixes from that album, tell them about my show that's coming out in their town next week. So some examples of data that you can um, glean from your sales. What's the ratio of albums versus tracks purchased by my fans? What proportion of purchases opted in uh, to receive emails from my artist? How many times was my widget shared? How many clicks did each share generate? Uh, and which channel was most popular? Facebook, Twitter? <coughs> which were the top purchaser countries from my last campaign? What you can see here is that data sourced from direct fan campaigns really gives you a picture of your fans and what their preferences are. And that's going to be invaluable when it comes time to plan your next campaign and what your next set of offers is going to be. So that is a uh, director fan in a nutshell. Should I stop now and ask if anyone has any questions? We'll just move right on. Hi. Oh, do you want to do the mic some questions? Hold on. Stats and stuff that you had before, is that like comparing that to say like a tube core or something where you get 
um, you start for distribution to the tube, you get information about where your sales have gone, the part of where which countries are buying it from, and that kind of thing. Is that um, like similar? I mean, I'll we'll probably get through more into it, but just how does that compare with direct fan? Like, so curious. Uh, you know, that's a good question. I'm actually not all that familiar with TuneCore. Maybe if someone in the audience of expert people has some experience with TuneCore. I don't know what kind of data comes back from um, they're an aggregator, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I guess the the difference is that with, I mean, with TuneCore, I'm not sure. Do you know about the data you get from TuneCore? A little bit. It's, it's like it's another that I've been working with, and he's just sent me a lot of data and stuff, and it has things like just having money full detail, but it has things like it's from this country and it's from buyers. And I think that there's, you know, there's no reason why you would think of TuneCore and having a direct fan um, channel as separate. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. Yep. What, what, I'm, what I'm trying to express, I guess, is that direct fan can always coexist with all of those other channels, and you, should, you shouldn't give up things like TuneCore because they do a great job of putting your, you know, your product in all the stores. That's what they're doing, right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So you always get that to happen because there are always going to be people who go to those channels who buy their music through stores. And if your music's not there, then you know, you're missing a trick. So I think that they both need to coexist. And it's like supplementing what's sort of there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cheers. No problem. Okay, shall I move on? Oh, do you want to move? Okay, oh, right. I'm sorry. Uh, just, I didn't see. Yeah. yeah. Basically, if you don't have time to, to market yourself, direct to fans, some, some artists are quite busy and they're creating or that they don't have a manager. Um, would that be detrimental to their, to their marketing? Do they have to have to have to have that marketing campaign? Yeah, How many what's the alternative if they're quite busy or if they don't have that ability to get to people? I think yeah, I mean what you're what you're voicing here is kind of a, a, a very real problem for artists at a certain level who don't have the resources to take this on on their behalf. Um, I guess in those cases you just really need to scale down and find out what's essential. Obviously being better at your craft and improving your music is going to be the most essential thing, I imagine. Um, but, you know, I would never underestimate the fact that, ideally, if you are looking for commercial success, which, you know, not everybody is, but if you are, then you're going to need fans. So there is going to need to be some sort of projects undertaken by you uh, or someone needed on your behalf that actually do work towards building a fan base. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll get into a little more of the things that might help you along that way, surely. Thank you. Okay? Yep. Alright, I'm going to go into the next number two. We're going to touch on an hour launch timeline. Okay, so your launch timeline uh, is going to fall into three broad phases. We've got the fan acquisition and renewal phase. We have the marketing pre-sale campaign. And lastly, we have on-sale. For the rest of the session, I'm mostly going to focus on 1 and 2. So just having a look at 1 and 2 now, fan acquisition. What's that about? Fan acquisition is the process of finding, engaging, and connecting with, um, or converting, I guess that's it, uh, your fans. Now we find, engage, and connect with fans on a lot of different platforms. We have Twitter, we have SoundCloud, Facebook, YouTube, just to name a few. But the most important conversion, as far as direct fan strategy goes, is in acquiring a fan's email address. On a voluntary basis, with their permission. So no buying of lists. Now, why is this so important? Why is this so important? It's because uh, there's a lot of research that looks into email versus social media, and uh, I have a bunch of references which I can point you towards if you're interested. I'm not going to go into those now, just taking some of the key points. Um, I think one of, the, one of the main points to bear in mind when we look at social media versus email is that social media moves fast. There's a hell of a lot of messages being pumped into the news feed on Facebook and, and Twitter, you've got your stream, it's, you know, depending on how many people you follow, there's tweets popping up every 10 seconds, it's three or four a minute. There's a hell of a lot of noise. And as an artist with a message that you're hoping to get to your fans, and as a fan that wants to receive a message, it can be really hard to find the signal amongst all the noise. In favor of email, 94% of internet users uh, say that sending and reading email is their number one online activity. 75% of emails allegedly prefer to receive their marketing messages by email. And this is not even to get into the insights that you can get from email performance analytics. 
so things like open rates, click-through rates, which links were the most popular, uh, and subscribe rates, unfortunately, can be also very telling. Uh, and you've got the opportunity for things like A-B testing. Is there anyone who would like me to explain A-B testing? I should slide one. Okay, cool. Okay, A-B testing is brilliant for um, email lists. Uh, it's used in quite a lot of online spheres and probably things that aren't online. As far as I know, uh, it's used like this. You have a list, say you have a list of 10,000 names. If you do, that's great. Well done. Um, with A-B testing, what you can do is you can split your list in, into segments, maybe two segments. So you've got your A list and you've got your B list. And the way you will experiment from, from this is you send a slightly different version or an entirely different message out to, um, usually you take a message and present it in, in different ways, markedly different ways, and you send both of those versions out, you know, one to the A list, one to the B list, and then you can measure how the performance is against each other. So if the A list, you know, had a 38% open rate, uh, but the B list had a 22% open rate, then, you know, the, the deduction would be that the list, uh, that mail you sent to that A list performed better, so when you do future emails, you'll emulate that A list. Kind of a long-winded explanation. Does that make sense? Cool. Excellent. All right, second part we're going to look at for the timeline is the market pre-sale. Now, why have a pre-sale? This is probably a question you guys may be thinking right now. Uh, the reason we encourage a pre-sale is that it enables fans to buy from you um, as soon as you announce the album. Usually you're going to announce the album in a couple of weeks, a couple of months before it comes out, depending on the level of artist that you are. Um, and if you have a pre-sale set up from the go, from the moment that you launch or announce, your, um, announce the launch, then you remove any disconnect. You really allow your fans to uh, capitalize, you're capitalizing on that initial excitement and buzz that your fans have from hearing that there's a new album coming, they hear there's an album, they're waving their money around, and they can go straight to you and put it in a free order. So that's a brilliant one. Um, it also allows you to draw out your marketing window so you can really maximize your opportunities to market. Um, every time you have an announcement that's anything to do with your album or, or a tour or anything like that, you can always have it linking back to your pre sale So you're really maximizing your opportunities there. And if you happen to be concerned with um, chart numbers, then you can consolidate your first week sales to really ensure you get the biggest kick in that first week. Okay, so let's take a quick look at how you might plan your lead time. Alright, so we have an empty roadmap here. We start with the date caption. You want that to run for a minimum of two weeks. Two weeks is pretty short. I would say two months. In fact, I would say tonight. Go home and set up the data capture if you don't already have it. There's, there's no time like the present to be collecting fans, giving your fans the opportunity to ask you to, to market to them. The pre sale This can run for four to six weeks. There's no hard and fast rule though. It could be longer, it could be shorter. Not too much shorter though because you want to maximize those opportunities to market and push traffic towards your pre sale Following this we have the release date. And post-sale, there are uh, further opportunities to market, so you've got uh, the opportunity to release extra content, uh, you can release the, the stems of the tracks for remixes, you're going to put out videos, you're going to have a tour to, to announce, so it goes on. And that's your own launch timeline, we're going to move up. Questions? Does anyone want to ask any questions about that top timeline overview? Straightforward. Okay. Right. So, best practice data capture process. Now, what is the best way to get an email address is the natural question that we've arrived at. Um, there's a lot of options for uh, email sign-up widgets. There's a lot of different software platforms out there. Some of them are free, some of them are paid. Uh, there's a lot of ways, basically, that you can set up a uh, set up a an opportunity, a, a data capture input field on your website. Um, there's four key points that I would suggest that you keep in mind when considering which sign-up widget to use. 
the double opt-in. Now this is the basic premise of permission marketing. And what this means is that you are ensured that the list that's highly engaged and actually wants to be on your list has said not once but twice that yes, they would like to receive marketing from you. So the way this works is you have the initial input field, whether it's on Facebook or uh, whether it's on uh, a website, you enter your email address, you hit submit, and you're prompted to check your inbox. So you go to your inbox, lo and behold, there is a confirmation email, you've got to click confirm, and that's the double opt-in. Okay, so this is going to be the first serious step in creating this uh, spam relationship. So it's really important that you ensure that it's on brand, customized to your brand every step of the way. Third point is, um, ideally in order to incentivize people to sign up for your list, you'll offer them something in exchange of value. So usually that's going to be uh, a track, an MP3, could be other, other kind of digital content. And finally, you want to make it easy for your fans to share. Hopefully they're uh, pretty keyed up about getting onto your list or whatever the track is that you're offering as an incentive. So make it easy for them to slap it onto their Facebook, tweet about it, use it as a little badge or card. Alright, so I use Topspin, which some of you may have heard of, uh, as the platform of choice for data capture. I use Topspin's email for media widget and I extend it with some lab sketches called Bleach or Run or Download Anywhere. These are definitely most likely going to be jargon terms. I'm not going to go into them right now, but if you want to talk about this more, let's talk later. All right, but what I am going to do now is run through exactly how this data capture process works. So, here's the homepage for a band called The Vales. Uh, you can see there on the left, they use a modular bleach data capture widget. And bleach is just the, the Tosca name for it, so it doesn't need to be too frightening. Now, there's a clear call to action there on the widget, right there on the circle. When you click on that image, it rolls aside and it reveals a data input field. So your fan enters their email address in here, and they are prompted to go to their inbox. It says thanks to your inbox in case it's too pale to be seen on there. Um, they've also got some options to share the action on their social networks. So, jumping to the inbox, we have the confirmation email. This is what it looks like. Um, and this is the double opt in that I spoke of just a little earlier to ensure the email is really wants to be there. Um, an additional feature of the Topspin data signup is that it sends a pixel back to the um, Software back to the software platform so that you, the artist, are actually given information about where in the world your fan is, which is extremely valuable for marketing. Whether your fans are in Japan, whether they're in the UK, whether they're in France, we get that information. So we click through the confirm button uh, and we land here on custom light box. So this is custom, you can have this image look for the like. We have uh, the download option to download the incentive, usually an MP3. And you've also got the option to share your actions on social networks. So what does the sharing actually look like? Here we go. This is the Twitter share. Uh, you've, you've got the option of having a preset share message. You've got a lot of control over that. You can include a link back to the promotion, which you naturally be wishing to do. Um, you can include your own username. You can put in any hashtags that are relevant to the promotion. And on Facebook, it's pretty much the same story, except you have a little bit more leeway because you're able to include an image. Uh, and you can also, your text message can be longer than 140 characters. Um, again, you're going to link that back to the promotion. Or with Facebook, you can actually load the data capture widget right there in the stream, so there's no need for the fan to actually leave the cozy confines of Facebook. Okay, now the magic part. All of the sharing is tracked, so you are to a social network, uh, you've got information on how many of their friends have been clicked on the widget, and that gives you a click share ratio. So the click share ratio for this widget is 2.5. And what that means is that for every person who shared the widget, two and a half more people have clicked on it, which is, which is good, you know, that, that's a good number. The idea here is that you're able to measure and optimize your campaigns uh, and it, it gives you the opportunity to try and vary your incentives um, and measure how the conversions work out. 
this is especially useful um, for testing out different channels. So you might want to have uh, one widget sitting on Facebook, one's going to be on your website, you might send one out to a music blog, and you can test them against each other and see where your fans are actually coming from. Okay, so back to the flow. After you have downloaded and shared, um, close the light box, and in this case, I will land on the band's Facebook page. Now, with this process, you can set any page at all as the landing page. So it could be your store, it could be your website, uh, it could be a social profile. And it's a, it's a great extra opportunity to influence that next step that the fan takes. So these widgets uh, can be customised for any website. Um, here's some examples of different looking ones. This is a bleach widget created by somebody in this room. Um, this is a landing page for Paul Cutbrand, so that's the whole page taken up with the data caption. And a few more options here, just to show you how flexible the tool is. Okay, so I guess what I want to uh, emphasize here, with, with taking such a detailed look at this process, it's not a silver bullet for getting you 500 fans a week. You know, it's not, it's not going to do that for you. But if you use a process like this, you're ensuring that you've got the world for us of database building going on. And you're going to have those four key elements looked after. You're going to have your double opt-in, customised to your brand, offering an exchange of value for that email address, and all set up for sharing. Right, so the next step... Oh, hang on, questions? Hi. Hi, um, I wondered what you thought of Topspin versus Bandcamp with the only experience of that. Because I have actually tried to set up Topspin and I was a bit overwhelmed with um, all the stuff that's on there. So. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, that's a good question. Um, it's actually something I'm going to look at very briefly shortly, but not really in a lot of detail. So let's talk about it now. Um, there's a hell of a lot of choice and having Topspin being two options. <coughs> I mean, hang on, I'm trying to figure out how to frame this. Do you want me to talk about what the differences are, or how... Okay. Yeah, and, um, whether you pay monthly for them, or whether they're free services as well. Okay. Uh, let's see. It's, I'm actually not that familiar with the Bandcamp workings. Probably there are people in here who are, though, so you can please jump in and out if I'm wrong here. But what I understand of Bandcamp is that if you don't pay for it, you just pay a commission on sales. Is that right? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so you're not paying for Bandcamp. Um, and it's a, it's a very flexible and great service, and I would recommend it. The difference with Topspin um, is that it kind of... Topspin's in a slightly different league in that it is maybe better suited in its, in its full form, which, you know, has a lot of features built into it. So this data capture feature, that's just one thing. And even if I was running a Bandcamp campaign, I would probably still use Topspin's data capture because it has all the bells and whistles that I think are important. But when you're looking at running a pre-sale or um, Using other features, uh, Topspin has a lot more punch, so it's got it's got a lot more muscle behind it. So you, you're going to pay a little more, but you're going to have much more features at your disposal. So getting into a full comparison is a, is a little beyond the scope of, of what I can get into right now, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea. Yeah. Thank you very much. Does anybody else want to discuss the data capture process or anything else come into their mind that might be on topic? Alright, let me move into uh, the pre-sale. How do I create a pre-sale? Now, as this lady has just mentioned, there is a lot of choice on the market. Um, these are a few of the big players. Each of them has their strengths and their sort of niche that they're going to be best for. If you are finding yourself in a position where you have no idea which one's right for you or uh, what it actually means, then I would be happy to speak with you about what they do offer um, after this talk is done. So let's just have a look at what um, your average kind of standard pre-sale actually looks like. Okay, hopefully uh, you can see this okay. I'm going to highlight some of the elements which hopefully will help you. But this is a simple offer page for an artist called Little Boots. She put out an album called Nocturnes earlier this year. Um, and this is a great example of the three elements that I want to highlight to you in terms of what a pre-sale should look like. Front and centre, we have the offers. Okay, so this features four offers. You've got the vinyl plus t-shirt, 
um, sorry, mine on its own or mine on its t-shirt, and then you've got the CD on its own or the CD plus t-shirt. So you can't really miss those when you come to the page, they're kind of slap you in the face. Um, up in the top left, we have some page shares. So these are options for your fans to share the page onto Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Um, and again, this, this may seem a little easier to really use that, but um, you know, your fans are your fans. They want to they show that they're fans. Are. Such a huge part of being a music fan is about telling other people that you're a music fan. You know, it's part of your identity, the music that you're into. So people are often very keen to, to be able to be the first to share it or to let others know to be the one to tell. Don't underestimate the share if you were considering underestimating it. Uh, down the bottom beneath the office here we have uh, a data capture. And I kind of consider this to be an extension of the office. It's a free offer. Essentially there are going to be people who come to this page who aren't quite ready to part with their cash just yet for you. But they are hopefully going to be willing to part with their email address. So if you include this on the data capture page, then you know there's going to be people who don't want to spend, but hopefully they'll give you a try grab a free track, and then you're able to isolate all of those people on your list that have got onto your list through this campaign, and then you can uh, tailor your message to them to, to try and entice them to, to pile some money on whatever you like. Okay, so here's another example from the Vales. We have the offers in the middle, dropping off the page. Uh, we have our share links at the top left here, and down below the offers we have a data capture. You can see a bit of a pattern of immersion here. Third example, this is an artist called Paul Kalkbrenner who I work with. Uh, at the top we have the share links. In the centre here we have a data capture, slightly different layout here. And down below, possibly extremely hard to see on the screen, is uh, the offers. So we've got the four offers right there where you can't really miss them. So just to recap, in case I haven't made it awfully clear, um, you've got your offers, you've got your data capture, and you've got some options to share. So let's get a little bit deeper into what these offers are going to look like. Now your album is pretty likely going to be available uh, through Jingle, uh, maybe on iTunes, at Amazon, maybe even at HMB or whatever record store is still standing. So when you are selling it through your own website, through your own, um, through your own domain, you really want to make it interesting, give people a reason to kind of part with their cash. So it's going to be a combination of uh, digital, physical, and limited items, maybe a box set. <coughs> so some examples of, of limited of ideas, limited products that you might want to include could be a numbered Polaroid, or maybe you want to go down the road with a personalized phone call. It's up to you. Okay, so into some, um, some data here. This is a look at sales by quantity and those same sales in terms of revenue. So when I say quantity, I mean the number of sales. So this could represent, say, 500 sales that came through for this artist. Um, and when we look at it in terms of revenue, we're looking at the value of those sales. So how much were those 500 sales worth in terms of cash? Now, the blue section are offers that included a physical item. And the red section are offers that were digital only. So what we can see here on the left is that in terms of quantity, you had around, uh, this artist had around three quarters of their orders um, were for offers that included a physical item. And only about a quarter were for the digital only offer. But when we look at that in terms of value, it's kind of half, uh, it halves. You've only got 12% of your revenue coming through those digital only offers. So what we see from this is physical is, is worth more and it's, it's, more, uh, it's more popular. Um, as streaming becomes much more common, uh, your fans are a lot less likely to buy those digital only. Hello. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I mean, sorry. Sorry to cut you in mid-flow, no but is that data for that individual only, or is that data used, can be used across the board? You mean the specific data? Yeah, that specific the data. The specific data that I've um, collated for this slide is coming from one artist, but what I've done here, if it, if it kind of hammers home a little further, is I had a slide for this which was old. It had data from 2009 to 2011, I think. And the story that that data told 
was, um, I stand in front of this, it's going to mess up. But if you can imagine this, on the quantity side, we had, it was half and half. So in terms of quantity, about half of the people, about half the people were buying digital only, about half were buying physical. And this was aggregated, this data, the old data. <laughs> Crazy story. Um, but when we looked at revenue, uh, it, was, it was more like this picture. It was still a significant reduction in terms of value. But when I put together this data, which is more recent, it's from a, a pre-sale that occurred late last year, and it was bigger than $500, I should say, so it is more representative. Um, what I'm finding here is that, you know, that relationship is even more so now, with digital-only products being a lot less popular. Is that cool? Hopefully that made sense for everybody. Alright, so yeah, my, my theory here is that streaming becomes more common, fans don't really need to buy their album, but where they are a fan and they want to spend their money on you, they want to actually get something cool, you know, they want a cool t-shirt, they want it on vinyl, this is what, this is what, this is, you know, this is the trends of retail nowadays. And I guess what I would always encourage is that you actually just bundle your digital, not to devalue digital, we all know it's not got a lot of value anyway, unfortunately, that's a whole other argument. But you would always bundle your digital together with a physical product so that your fans are going to receive that download the minute your release date hits. No delays with the vinyl that like we sell within the same. Okay, so as a rule of thumb, you want to have at least three offers. I'd normally have a few more than that, but at least three. And you want to have one less than ten pounds, one between ten and thirty, and one more than thirty. And this is not hard and fast, this is just a rule of rule of thumb. And the reason I say this is you want to avoid leaving money on the table. Recently, I purchased from a big name artist who was running a pre sale, and his top offer was a £99 limited box set. Now, I was a little slow off the mark, and by the time I got to this pre sale, this limited edition box had all sold out. So, I, I, you know, I, I was kind of leaning toward it, but I couldn't. It was finished, it was gone, there was no, no, more, no more to be had. So, I looked down to what the next offer was, and was pretty horrified to find that the next offer down from a £99 box was £17, pounds, one seven. And that's a big drop, and I would have been willing to spend 40, maybe 40 to 60 pounds on something cool, um, but I couldn't. So this is money that the artist basically lost. I was willing to pay, they didn't give me the opportunity to spend it. So the risk that you take if you don't have evenly sort of staggered price points um, is that your fans who are willing to pay that top price are either going to select downwards and you're losing money, or they're just going to abandon it together. Alright, so we've looked now at what does a pre-sale look like. Uh, and to answer that question, we have a range of compelling offers uh, at different price points. Uh, we have a data capture included, and we have some options to share the page. Does anyone want to ask any questions about the pre-sale before we get into the last section? Okay. Alright, so all the building blocks are in place. We've got our mailing list is accumulating all the while. Um, we've carefully planned the pre-sale, we've built it and it's ready to go. It's live, it's launched. Uh, how do we go about now keeping the fans engaged? Is it going to be a case of if you build it, they will come? I think we all know that's probably not going to be the case if we believe anything from Wayne's world. Um, have you guys got any ideas about how you might go about keeping your fans engaged? I want to turn this over to the room to start with. So are you ready? Anyone got an idea for me? Come on. This is great. Keep asking questions on other sides. Yeah, concentrate on your craft, that's smart. Yeah, actually I have another question, oh, a bit outside yes. of, of, of 
the, the, the chat. Sorry. Sorry. Um, um, what about if you're like a complete unknown artist, but you you do have uh, an album? Do you have like any any strategy or any idea like to 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 make um, I mean to create a fan list instead of release directly to your fan your album? <coughs> So you want to have fans? Yeah, exactly. Ones. Do you have like any ideas? Like, yeah. you you have the album, but you have no fans. Yeah. So I'm... <laughs> yeah. No, that's a it's a very important question. It's kind of the first question that um that we are probably all asking. I imagine. How do you get some fans to start with? Now, I don't have any brilliant answers to that one. I guess the answer that I or the discussions that I normally have when I when I have this conversation with friends or peers in the industry would be the one that people always say, which is be really good, be the best that you can, you want to hear that. I think you need to start with your friends and family, you know, this, this is where you start, you start with your friends, uh, you hopefully you capture the imagination of some of them, and it goes from there, you know, I mean, I'm not an expert at, at becoming a brilliant fan, I just know a lot about the tools that you can use to create a fan list, so, did anyone else got an idea on how you start getting fans? <laughs> Everyone would like to hear it. You should be doing this. I imagine, can a person talk about what you've done? What are they going to say? Oh, it's an indie musician releasing an indie album. If that's what they're going to get, then you're not, you're not interesting enough. Be interesting. That, that's my advice. This is what I'm trying to do. And if you do something that is valuable or interesting, people will talk about it. This is the fourth event and see how many people are here through word of mouth. It's something interesting, it's something they're looking for. People talk about it in the group, they're friends, so, yeah. Hey there, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> How to get kind of fans get, but to be honest, I have my doubts that the album is even a valid thing even more uh, in music, but, um, you know, uh, going back to the question you asked and how to keep them engaged, no, I don't have I don't have an album yet or anything, but um, in uh, how I imagine that I will, what I am starting to do is is continuous content. I don't see I don't believe in building up to a big album launch anymore. I don't know. I shouldn't be so blank about. It. I'm sure there's you know there's artists that it will work for, but the way I see things going for myself is um, that. The music, the art of the music is going to be a continuous, living, evolving thing. And through my website, 
through social media, I will be constantly creating music, Maybe through art. Emails too. Sorry? Maybe through email too. Ah, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so, you know, the things that I've been doing, for example, is, um, um, you know, my blog is really in its early days, but I have this thing called Words and Pictures, where I take some lyrics from one of my songs, just three, four lines, find a photo online that, that kind of connects with that, and I just post that up. And then, you know, the next day, I'll, uh, you know, post a song, and the day after that, I might, um, you know, uh, take a, a photo of some hand scribbled lyrics that I, you know, when I was writing the song. So that's the way I'm thinking about approaching things. No, that's cool. It's, that's great. Yeah. Some more? Yeah. 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 Hi. I think it's really important if you also want to have fans is to expose them in aspects of your personality that don't necessarily relate it to their artistic form or music. But it's like, for example, I love fishing or I love cooking. I make that pretty apparent on my website. It's even pictures of the fish and stuff. But like, it's like almost a thing where people go like, oh, you know, that's quite cool. I like that. I like cooking. Oh, you know, so it's then the person gets a different level of kind of intimacy with you. Uh, without being all that, you know, like Instagram pictures every 10 seconds, but you know, you kind of get information out that are not related to the artistic side per se, but it's things that are amalgamated into who you are, kind of as a person, which then kind of affects your art. Can I ask a question? Is that right? Yes, please. Well, basically, that bugs me, you know, because like I have music on my mind all the time, and it's uh, and I write is one of is one of my functions. I can't do without writing, but what I find is. Or, 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 you know, we've got so many means nowadays to market it ourselves, but a lot of the times it's like you have to divide your brain in so many things, like you have to divide it into the part where you give yourself into the moment and you write a song, and then you have to divide it and get away from it and be like an individual that has to think about figures and other stuff. Like, do you think that this is going to, because it's fairly, let's say, a new thing, like 10, 15 years, would you say that kind of approach maybe? Listen up, listen up. Yeah, so do you think in the brown scheme of things it's going to change the way artists create music? Because now they have to think all that stuff as well. Yeah, no, this is something that the Gentle Mono Media kind of touched on as well. I think it's a, it's a good issue to raise because I guess it's particularly relevant for us who are starting out, who don't yet have a support team around them. Um, and as I said to this, to this gentleman over here, I think it's just a matter of Figuring out what's important um, to start with. It's maybe not important to start with to have your hand in every single thing, but I think it's it's definitely important to make your music available, like on SoundCloud, for example, to have an, a mailing list widget. Hopefully, people will, will want to sign up. It's, it's not that easy to get people to sign up. I know that. Um, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. Like there's so many things I need to figure out before I can get anywhere. I think that the really that. The, the, uh, the advice that a few people have had today it is brilliant, and that is really just focus on the music, do some touring, make sure you've got a few of those building blocks in place so you have a Facebook page, or you have some way for people to find you, and, and that's going to be enough to start with. Once you start needing those extra things, there's going to be new people who materialize that will help you, I'm sure. Hi, um, I want to ask, I know that keeping the fans engaged, um, I noticed when I'm performing at venues and gigs uh, that, and also from other artists' point of view, that they, you know, they've got a CD, they give the CD to somebody free of charge, or, um, you know, they just interact with them, but I know with the, with the websites as well, is it, is it a good idea to kind of entice people to go on the website by saying you can win the CD, or... Do you think that's a good yeah, way to Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, anyway, if you've got, got someone visiting your website, that's half the battle done, you know? Like, so there's any way that you can get them there, then, then do it. <laughs> and then once they're there, you can, you know, offer them some free music for an email address, brilliant. Invite them to look at you on other social platforms, but, I mean, by all means. Um, sorry, also, I just wanted to ask another question. It has, it has more to do with uh, what you were discussing a bit earlier, but um, in terms of the pre-sales, what, what, in your opinion, what is best? Because I know I've got friends that are musicians as well, and they do single launches, 
EP launches, album launches, what is really the best you can do if you've got, you know? <laughs> I think it, I mean, this, the, the gentleman over here was, was talking about the, yeah. the drip feed, kind of constant, maybe, this, maybe the album isn't always relevant for, for you as a musician, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Some people, like what, Radiohead or, or December sort of, they put out albums as like concepts, so it's, it's a whole package. But other people, like I think especially in the dance, Sector, we call it the sector genre. Uh, they're releasing tracks kind of all the time, and then there'll be a remix and there'll be some kind of crazy measure. So it really just depends on, on you. Uh, I guess that doesn't really help, does it? I know that it can be really hard trying to figure out how to package I, the music. I, just because I've been told, uh, just because I, I'm looking to the EV launch, but I've also been told to do single launch as well by okay. another label. So I just, mm -hmm. I just want you to know what. You know what is the best way, really? What, in your opinion? Because I've got friends that have done EP watches, I've got friends that have done single watches, and they've both been very good. So I'm looking at what, yeah. what you know, what is. What about maybe? I mean, maybe look at the music that you, the kind of, you, you've obviously got some music that you're ready to release, and sort of figure out what makes the best package. But I mean, at the moment I'm going to, you know, towards the EP watch, but I just want to know what. Just see, you've got a few more tracks, right? Yeah, I don't know whether it's, it's you know whether it's a good idea to do like a single launch and then do an EP launch after that, or do an EP launch and then do a couple of single launches before you do the next EP. So I don't know. I think that it's not going to be the end of the world if you choose. Right. You know, you've got to learn from it. Okay. So yeah, take a step. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> fast now. Hi. Hi. Um, just had an idea about the. Um, like networking with other musicians and not hijacking is the wrong word, I want a better word, but kind of, um, yeah, hijacking their fans too, but in a mutual way. So if they're supporting you or you, you, know, you remember how famous Dido was before she featured on their Eminem's album? And you can do that locally on a local scale and, um, you know, support bands from out of town, then you go and get with them and they get their fans to come and support you. And, you know, like network, when, I don't think musicians are in competition with each other. Because everyone is unique, they've got their own voice, their own story, their own message. Um, so yeah, so like help each other, support each other, and network. Yeah, that's that's excellent, absolutely. Um, and on a, I mean, just as a kind of a, a higher scale example of that exact thing, um, there was a, a campaign recently, well, in the last few years, I should say, where uh, Interpol and Pixies played a show together. I think it was in Mexico City somewhere like that, and preceding the show, each of them sent out an email to their lists promoting the other one's music, and it, it basically um, gave them the opportunity to share their lists, it gave each, everyone on the Interpol list was given the opportunity through the means of downloading some tracks of, of getting onto the Pixies list, so I mean, that's kind of, a, it's the same thing really, but on a, on a slightly different scale, so definitely use your peers, or work with your peers, would be great. Have got any more? I've got a, a, few, a few more. I don't know. Yeah, I'll I think I've got a yeah. Okay. Let's keep track of time. Watch ticking time. I've been in the industry now 26 odd years, and what I'm finding here today is, is okay, it's valid and it's good. What's strange is that everybody seems to be looking about the image. It's, it should be about the substance of your material, whatever you're working on. And you will know, I mean, okay, now most people don't do album launches because they're all pushed by labels to put out one track or an EP because obviously labels are not financing it. But whatever works for yourself, you will know. If you've got an album's worth of material, put out an EP, put out a single track. Keep that relationship with your Fans, if you can think of you as a shop window, there must always be more in the shop than is in the window. It's as simple as that. I would totally agree. We just say experiment, see what works for yourself. There's no global solution. Whatever you might do might not be good for your journal because somebody else is doing it. Just experiment. Simple. Especially if you're not big artists with 20,000 Facebook fans, let's say, or 5,000 people on the mailing list. You can experiment. Nobody's going to tell you not to do it. Nobody's going to tell you, oh, why have you done this? Simple. Questions? Okay, I'm just going to have a few more slides and then we can take any more questions and then I'll be done. Um, so,
keeping things engaged. There's some amazing ideas. Thank you, everybody who's contributed. It's really cool. Um, I think just in terms of the, the pre-sale itself, just to bring it back to, to kind of the topic that I've been um, going through, basically everything we've talked about it would, would also be applicable to, to marketing and pre-sale. How might you do that? Uh, I guess one idea that I had um, was to take a cue from the crowdfunders. So we've got Kickstarter, uh, Pledge Music, Indiegogo, I think there's a, there's a few other options. Um, what really impresses me with the, the crowdfunding platforms is that these guys will take a, a, a campaign, if you call it a campaign, uh, and they make it into an event. And it's something that everyone is welcome to participate in. I think that really works for them. So this is a, a Slash campaign. Um, I took a screenshot of it a couple of days ago. I wouldn't be surprised if it's reached its target by now. Um, the basic pledge uh, up in the top right there is a, is a $10. So it's like a $10 entry point. Uh, and then there's a, there's a whole series of packages down the right hand side, um, which maxes out at $159, although I'm sure there's ways of putting in more should you wish to. Um, in the center here, we have a series of updates on the pledge page. Now, these are only, uh, you can only click through these if you have made that basic pledge of $10. So, what this means is that uh, in creating this campaign and making these kind of locked, I suppose, gated updates, they've created a sort of an exclusive event. Um, and once you're through the gate, once you've paid that $10, you, you really are going to get a lot of interaction. You feel like you're supporting something that means something. And that's a really good feeling to capitalize on with your fans. Um, I guess what I would want to learn from this is that it's another way of creating opportunities to talk about your upcoming album. These guys, are, they've got a lot of updates, there's a hell of a lot going on, they've got photographs, they've got video messaging. This kind of stuff you can uh, deliver via a platform like Pledge or Kickstarter, um, but you can also deliver these by email. So, uh, when I used to work at Topspin, we had a saying which was snowballs, not avalanches. Uh, and the idea with that is that you want to plan a timeline of events um, and, and updates, things that you're going to drip feed to your network. Um, some of these are going to be more appropriate for social networks, some of them are going to work well for your mailing list, um, but it's, it's good to be your fans to get used to hearing from you in, in various ways with the, the drip feed approach rather than just dumping an avalanche of information on all once and then kind of disappearing again. So some ideas about how you might um, engage with your fans during the pre-sale. Uh, you might thank the purchasers, thank the fans who've bought from you, um, ideally to uh, stimulate them to share their action with their networks, um, or maybe even to upgrade their purchase. Uh, you can send out some bonus exclusives, so that might be some demo versions or some tracks that people didn't know they were going to get. It's going to be a pretty exciting event. It's something people will likely to share. Um, and you can message your fans who haven't purchased yet from you um, carefully and work a little harder at giving them a reason to buy from you. Okay, so that brings me to the conclusion. Um, we've looked at what is direct to fan, we have touched on an album launch timeline, gone through in some detail uh, best practice data capture process, looked at an album pre-sale structure, and we've had a great discussion on keeping fans engaged. Thank you all very much. Your attention, thank you, Barbican, thank you, Tommy. Uh, I'm Jesse. If there's any more questions, now's the time. Or you can just clap. <laughs> Do we have any more questions or are we probably going them all? Anybody who's curious? Still curious? So either they got nothing or you're too good. <laughs> Okay. okay, so um, you're busy making music, and now you've got to be an online marketer, a web developer, a videographer, a photographer, and everything else. When do you get time to actually make music? And have to this is definitely a thing. This is a thing that's emerging, and I understand that. But I think that this is the, the highest level of ideal you want to aim for. You don't have to emulate every step of this. You're going to find what works for you. You can strip it back to the bare elements until you reach a point where you're able to work with a friend, take on a manager, a label, if you wish to do that. But you can't get there if you don't do this. But I think that you can, I think that you can get there. You just have to be selective. You don't need to go all out if you're completely like, you, you need to tick all those boxes. There's some boxes that are, that are more important than others. And that is like being able to be bound online and once people do find you, giving them a way to connect with you so that you can actually follow up with them again. 
I mean, that's key. You don't need to worry too much about all this stuff all at once. Those are the key takeaways, I guess. Be online. If you want to be found, not everyone wants to be found. If you want to be found, be findable as much as you can, and, and give fans an easy way to connect with you, and, and make it so that you can find them again. That's the main reason we have a mailing list. You can actually reach out to those people again. Okay. Um, just a response to that and a few other people. Um, I've an artist I've been working with because I'm coming from the producer side and the other side. But he, what he's done is he's got a team of people together, and he's done that with basically hardly any money. Uh, and what he's used is used leverage. So, for example, he's found this photographer, this Italian photographer. And if you need to find people who are willing to work and who are amazing, there's so many Italians in this country and realised who are like into media and, and photography and stuff. But he's found a photographer, and so he's used leverage. So the difference between leverage and like delegation is instead of saying, "Look, do all my photos for me and whatever else," he's done. Okay, he's got about fifteen thousand followers on his Facebook, so um, which he's just like, over a couple of years of promoting himself. But he said, "Look, you know, I'll promote all your all your photos on my website if you come do some photos for me." So then he's then they're kind of getting that share that way, and then he's saying he's got a video photo doing the same thing. So I think that's the best thing that he's found is just finding other people. So you don't have to be a web developer, you don't have to know this. Find someone who wants to do this, who's a fan of your music, you'll go, yep, yeah, okay, let's, let's hold each other out. That's yeah, that's excellent. Thing. I think Tommy's an advocate of that as well. Or just give business to somebody. Pay little money. Like, not everything's for free in this world, so... Um, yeah, hey, um, yeah, I mean, I, I sympathise with the idea that you can't spend all your time doing music, you know, uh, you, you have to do the marketing, I mean, I have a day job, you know, <laughs> I have to do that as well, but, uh, you know, I, I try to take a, a bigger perspective, you know, for hundreds of years, well, for thousands of years, people made music uh, besides hunting and gathering, and then we had a period of uh, patronage, I think it's called, you know, where a rich king uh, or a religious person would fund your art, and then we had a situation from for about a hundred years where you could sell music on pieces of plastic. And that was great, but you know, it's 2013 now and, and it's changed, you know. Uh, and you know, this this opportunity it's it's different. It's not the same as, as 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, it sucks you uh, you have to do a bit more in the beginning, but this immense opportunity now, you know, people couldn't sit at home and record music and, and put it out for everyone around the world to listen for free. That's amazing. You know, it's just, it's different, and uh, you know, it's, 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 there's, there's new challenges, but there's new opportunities. That's the way I see it. Cool, thank you. I totally agree. And we have somebody else. Well, I, the only thing I want to touch on is like, I think it, we've kind of forgotten all these cool tools. We're in the music industry, we're trading, we're trading in songs. So whatever's going on, you need to be writing. If your songs suck, no one's going to get engaged. And that's the bottom line. Yeah, we're, we're trading in songs, that's our currency. So if the songs suck, no one's going to get engaged, so just keep writing whatever. Yeah, that's... no, definitely, that's a brilliant advice. I guess my, my assumption was that everyone's music would be brilliant to start with. Anyone else, or are we take a break? Tommy? Questions? Right. Yep. Okay, so this is going to be the last one, so we'll take a break for the next talk. And after you, it's going to be a wave of applause. <laughs> um, so, with becoming uh, completely independent and um, taking on all these aspects of, of promotion and everything yourself, and you're, you're, so we're, we're talking about not um, being involved with uh, the support and protocol of label anymore. So, not necessarily, this, this can exist with the label. Um, do, I mean, is, is there any point in, in pursuing that, that old way of doing things? I mean, oh, no, absolutely. I mean, it, it really depends on preference. Um, I mean, labels have got a lot of promotion. You can rely on them to do a lot of promotion for yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's some, you know, radio pluggers and booking agents and distribution. Yeah, I think that if, if you want to look at the, the marketer or the direct-to-panel, Market or the digital market. This is 
It's basically, it's, it's kind of a new role in the team. So ideally, in the perfect world, you're going to be the artist and have 100% of your time available for making your music better and just working on that. And you're going to have the people who have these things for you. Um, and a lot of the time, if you have a label, that'll, that'll be that team. Um, I guess when you're not yet at the level where you have that perfect world, which, you know, is a hell of a lot of us, um, then we need to find ways of, of substituting. I've lost my thread. <laughs> well, it's just, well, I mean, because there are things, things missing from yourself, and maybe I'm just not grasping yet, but yeah. I mean, like, like things like, um, Oh, yeah. like a, now this is never meant to replace shops. any of that. Um, having director fan strategy is not about replacing a booking agent or you know having a label that you're managing. You still need to have all those things. This is just it's based, it's an emerging channel. Like I said at the start, it's not new, but the tools are now within anyone's grasp, so it's much more accessible. Uh, you have the opportunity to have that direct relationship with your fans. That's never meant to replace. Uh, any of those traditional roles, usually, hopefully, maybe. You still gonna need a booking agent, yeah. but I don't understand that. <laughs> Is that cool? Um, yeah, pretty, pretty sweet. Yeah, just quickly, in regards, there's always someone, there's always an A&R or someone looking to listen to your music within labels. So, as the gentleman said before, depending on how good your music is, if it's good or it's at a good level, it's always going to get to someone in a label, and it's always going to spread. That's that's what I believe. If, if it's a good, if it's good music, it's going to spread. It's, it's going to go out there, and you'll, you'll the be, taken, be taken care of. All right. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Cheers for that. I think we're good enough to have a little break and go to the next topic. I hope you enjoyed so far. So this is Jessie Fuller. You can, you can find her at We Steve Works. Um, I will put everything on the website, the video of what you just experienced, the questions, the, the presentation, contact, everything else. So if you want to reach out to Jesse for something specific, can be done either tonight or you know later on the website. Um, something I'd like to say is that tomorrow I'm going to send you all an email because we got kind of sponsored by Topspin and they give away a few accounts, free accounts, yearly accounts, and normally they cost $500, but they will give away a few of them for free. So I will send you some questions. It's going to be a little survey. I want to collect your opinions, what you believe about things, because I don't want to give it away to everybody that will just grab a free code and never use it. I want people that will actually make something happen with this. So this is about tomorrow, or if I'm not dead, but tomorrow the day after. So, all right, I think we'll take a little break and... All right. So now you see why I learned this stand-up comedy. So now you see why I got the first discussion first, how to launch your album. I knew it was going to be a lot of people, and then it's about more theoretical, but very interesting topic. Everybody would go, I knew that. So it's, I think it, it would kind of work. So now we're going to have Ron, who will talk about social influence. He's, I don't know, I chased him a lot, so he could come here and, and talk. Before that, I would like to thank um, Andre. The previous talks were, were held, well, facilitated by the World Foundation, which is around Victoria Tube Station. And they they very kind, you know, and they help us with everything, facilitate the, the event. And he's our sponsor. So, talking about SMEs, about small, medium enterprises, if you're interested in this, um, two minutes for, for Andre to explain what they do. So you might be interested in attending their seminars or anything else. So. Cool. Thanks, Tommy, for that. One, two. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's going to take two minutes. I'm not going to talk for very long because I know you want to get to this gentleman here with some great information. Um, 
As a great talk by Jesse, there was um, a couple of points I took away from it, which was around really starting to think of yourselves not just as artists in this new age digital technology, we have to think of ourselves as businesses, small businesses, medium businesses, and want to grow to larger businesses. So we've got to really have a vision of ourselves as more than just the artist. And if there's a team around us that help us do that, then so be it. If we're doing it ourselves, that's fine too. We do have to start thinking like this. So I'm just going to talk to you quickly about an organisation I work for. Um, it's called London Fusion. And London Fusion is a, it's a partnership between four universities across London. And what we do is we offer business support and development to small and medium enterprises in the creative and digital industries. So it's funded by the European Union, so we've been given a £5 million pound to spend with small businesses in London and really offering them a series of assistance, as I said, to help them get some growth. And it's all fully funded, so it's free for the businesses in London who are in the creative and digital sector. So what we do is we help companies to um, identify new opportunities. We help you to collaborate with other companies, which I think is really important. And that came up a lot in Jesse's talk. This idea that people in the music industry could collaborate on projects. I mean, I just had an interesting conversation with young, one young lady who's traveling from Newcastle to gig. Not getting paid well by promoters, sometimes getting ripped off, not getting expenses met. Collaboration between four different musicians or bands could then go on and put their own show. Why not? For that cost of travelling and setting up and doing lots of investment to do a gig for someone else, you could rent your own venue by collaborating. So it's this idea of collaboration we're really in favour of and trying to get people together with others who can help them. So as like I said, it's for London-based SMEs. SMEs are small, medium enterprises, so basically it could be a one-man band up to someone turning over £40 million, pounds, so it's quite a wide, wide berth of companies that we'll talk to, or businesses we'll talk to. Um, we've got to work in a creative or digital sector, have to be ambitious and looking to grow, and a desire to expand what they're doing. And so those are our criteria there. Um, let's round through them. And what we'll offer you is, um, basically it's, it's very particular to each person what you need. So we try to offer a tailored service. So the first thing we'll do is sit down with you and look at what your goals are, look at where you want to grow to, what you want to achieve. And then we'll try and put in resources from our partners and help you achieve that. So it'll be stuff that can help you grow. It might be about giving you information or access to information or expertise that can help you achieve some of your goals. And um, here's some of the things we do. So we have a collaboration award where you can work together with other companies, get access to up to £10,000 in funding to work on a project. Uh, we've got, we can put a PhD student in your, in your organisation for six months to maybe do some of those tasks you're not equipped to do. Um, we offer things like business model workshops so you can sit down and work out what's my model for growing, growing our, our activities, whether it's as a band, Music making entity, how you want to define yourself. You do need a plan, you need a model to do that or a roadmap. So we can help you put that sort of thing together as well. And these are the partners. We work at um, Lancaster University Management School, that's who I work for. Um, also Queen Mary University, which is in East London, if some of you are familiar with that. We've got the Royal College of Art and C4CC, which is the University of London. These are how many businesses we're going to be working with over the next two years. So a thousand, we want to meet a thousand, over a thousand companies. And we want to work closely around 500. And then work extremely closely to help them create something new with 120. So these are the numbers we're looking at over the next two years. A year and a half, we go six months. And we've got stuff like talks and events, um, events like this around different subjects. Uh, we've been working with Tommy for a while on dark music talks to deliver a lot of these in our office in St. James's Park. Um, we can give you access to experts to talk about different trends. It could be around technology, it could be around social networking, digital delivery, whatever it is you need. And also we provide events for you to network and collaborate with people who can help you. So maybe you need someone who develops apps. Where do you meet them? Maybe you need to do a, some sort of collaboration with them. One hand scratches the other, you do something for them, they do something for you, 
and you move forward together. So we try to encourage those sort of relationships as well. And as in masterclasses, we'll help you identify new opportunities and we'll also um, offer advice and support if you want to develop a business plan or a marketing strategy or anything like that. We can sit down and help you do that too. So, I'm going to draw this to a close now. Your next steps, my colleague over there, Norm, give you a wave, you can either talk to her or talk to me at the end of this and um, we can give you some advice or some information about how to get in touch with us and take things forward. Or just tell you more about London Fusion and how it can help you. And so I'll cut that short now and move on to our speaker. Thank you. Great. So we're going to start the next discussion. Again, this will be more theoretical. So any questions, any, will be more like novelty, you know, it's not a normal discussion that we will do with everybody. You will not talk with, about releasing your album, you know, with your friends, you will do that. But you want to talk about social influence. So I think there is a lot of knowledge to take out of this presentation. And feel free to participate. Ron. Hey, how's it going? Uh, really distracting by the way, so if you see me looking over that way, uh, <laughs> I should be back this way. Uh, my name is Ron, and I'll talk a little about influence. Uh, the actual great part is that a lot of the questions at the end of Jesse's uh, session uh, play into a lot of what I'm going to talk about here, about how, how you reach people, how you get people engaged with you, uh, and, and all that great stuff. So, uh, Tommy asked me to just remind everyone, if you're going to tweet, to use the hashtag, hashtag Dark Music Talks, and if you're going to talk about me, Make sure you use my full name, Ron Schott, uh, not Arshot, because Arshot gets really mad at when people tweet him about social and stuff like that. Sorry. He's a, uh, he's a geologist and very famous, and I'm not famous, <laughs> and, and I don't know anything about rocks. I know about rock, but uh, not rocks. So, yeah, definite uh, kind of overlap there. Uh, this is me. I, I'm from Seattle. I, I moved here eight months ago now, um, and I get the Big opportunity to work with a lot of awesome brands here in the UK. Uh, sadly, moving here took me away from working uh, with a lot of the, the people I like to work with in the United States. Uh, uh, this is this big music and arts uh, event called Bumper Shoot in Seattle, which was a really, really huge event. And I uh, get to work with a lot of great artists and stuff there. Uh, and it also took me away from working with all my friends who are musicians and who uh, actually do play shows or, or gigs here, as you call them. I still haven't got, haven't got that yet. But, uh, you know, I, I got the chance to come here and I'm really happy to get to talk to you guys about uh, social and about influence. So really, what is influence? Influence is this idea that you know, people have the capacity or power to change people's minds or to influence their actions, influence what they do, influence what they talk about, influence what they buy, that sort of stuff. And uh, in my job in the advertising industry, I, I, I talk about this in terms of people buying products, or people changing a behavior, or people talking about a brand in a certain way. Uh, you know, but, but influence is, is really about everything you do in your life. Um, as much as we like to think we're all individuals all the time, there's someone who is influencing us in some way that then creates this sort of idea of an individual uh, that, we, that we create. And then in the digital space, which is what I, I really focus on, you know, this is, it's really the same thing. Um, really just kind of came of age when the digital age really started. But if you really think about it, um, all the way back to the time of the Roman times or even when people were just starting to come together in villages, um, people were actually influencing each other all the time. Because when you went to the store and you didn't know it, or we went to the market, so I mean, we're in the stores, when we went to the market, you were going to buy the best goat uh, there was there. You were going to buy the best carrots that there were in the market. How would you really know who had the best carrots? It was all about influence and what people were telling you, uh, what you kind of perceived to be the truth. And so what we have now is this idea that in the digital age, it's, it's just kind of changed. We're, we're still having the same conversations. We're still talking uh, with people about our interests and about our wants, our needs, and people are, are helping us down that line. And in, in the digital space, it's breaking down these three things. Relevance, reach, and resonance. So, how closely is someone actually tied to a subject? Uh, whether that is your type of music, or whether that is music in, in general, or whether that's 
someone who may work in a label and they're, they're in charge of the or something like that. How closely are they tied to this idea? Reaches. How many people actually listen to this person? In the digital space, it's allowed us to actually increase our reach exponentially. You know, they forget that about before the internet started, normal people had a general circle of influence of about 10 to 20 people. These are your family, your close coworkers, uh, people you may know, and just, just me. But now, in, in this digital age, where they say people actually have normal Facebook users has over 200 friends. Most of them don't know half of them, but they still have these 200 friends. They're seeing stuff they're talking about. Throw Twitter in there, it's another 200 followers. People all of a sudden have this reach of 400, 500, 600 people, and that's just for a normal user. Um, but when you're talking about people who are maybe influential, uh, you know, you start to see that number grow even more. So we're talking thousands, tens of thousands of people in some cases. And then resonance, that's something that we use uh, in our measurements to actually measure how effective someone is at, at affecting change. Um, in the digital space, you look at that as something like, let's say someone tells me about a product or about a new band. I tweet out a link to their new YouTube video. How many people are actually clicking that off of, off of my tweet? So how many people are seeing what I say? saying that, okay, that wrong guy actually maybe knows what he's talking about, we're going to go and look at it. Um, and so that's how we measure resonance in the digital space. And like I said, the, this idea of influence, is, it's been evolving over time, um, all, the, all the way back from the markets. But, you know, over the past couple of years, it's, or a couple of decades, sorry, it's actually changed. In, in the internet age, in the 90s, when we were all signing onto the internet, using Yahoo Messenger and all that great stuff for the first time, using uh, Google when it when it came about and, the, and all this idea about how we find information, uh, that just that access was key. And, and back then it was simply having access to this wider world that gave us the, the power to actually influence people. As the social web came along, uh, all of a sudden we were connected to more people, not just information. We had the ability to reach out, the ability to share, the ability to kind of pick and choose what was actually coming into our life in terms of information and then pick and choose what we're going to share out as well. And now, over the past couple of years, there's this idea of real time and how that's evolving. We have the ability to, you know, as I, I, was, as I was sitting in the back, I was looking at the hashtag uh, that people were using uh, during Jesse's talk and seeing what people were saying about that. We're able to dive into these conversations in real time and that gives us not only resonance, or sorry, relevancy, but also gives us context, right? We're there, we're in the moment, we're able to talk to people. Also, sorry, if you have any questions as I'm going along, if I say some kind of industry jargon or something, throw your hand up in the air, throw something at me, and uh, I'll go back and answer your question. And this, this whole idea about influence is really based on the fact that people are definitely more connected, they're more mobile, and they're more open. In the UK alone, 37% of people in the country are actually using mobile social. So that's not only just using their phone to check a place on Google or using their phone to text their friends, they're actually using their phone and having conversations. Uh, that's really important when you think about the fact that you're out at a gig, your friends are out at a gig, and they see this brand new artist and also they're just blown away. And they, they share that information with their friends on Twitter, they share uh, Instagram video of those people up there actually singing or playing their guitar, banging, and banging a shovel against the floor, I don't know. And um, all of a sudden, this, this becomes something that's shareable. And, and that's something that's really exciting to us. Uh, in the industry, it's really exciting to me personally. And it's really scary to a lot of people as well, right? Because all of a sudden, you, I, you can be able to say, you can be me, and I can drop this microphone at any second time. Someone snaps a picture of it, all of a sudden it's out on the web. Stupid American guy drops a microphone at Barbican, people laugh him off stage. Um, you know, and, and it is scary, but at the same time, it's really empowering. Um, because when you think about the fact that maybe someone out in this crowd, or maybe someone at the next crowd at your next gig, could be that person that knows the right person, that knows the other right person, that gets your foot in the door, it becomes really exciting. But how does this actually apply to you guys? Um, it's this idea about the, the, the fact that we have this this great connected culture now, um, we also have a lot of noise out there. Um, when you're up on stage or when someone's actually listening to your music maybe through your website, it's not the only thing going on in their life. And we can make 
the same devices that let us share stuff for that, right? Uh, we've all been at a gig and seen people next to you standing there just on their phone the whole time. Or uh, you're talking with someone and they pull their phone out of their pocket. My wife gets mad at me all the time. Um, but being able to like cut through this noise is actually uh, a pretty hard thing to do. Especially when there are uh, 400 million tweets a day just out of the UK alone. And they're not all just about food anymore. Um, but, the, but then when you think, through that noise, there are these people who are making decisions, these people who are tastemakers. And that's really what we're uh, going to talk about, how we find them. This is what I call the typical influence pyramid. You've got these people who are your, your, your top tier influencers, your columnists, people who write for Pitchfork, some guy that somehow weaseled his way into a column at the Daily Mail or something like that. And these people feel that they have the right to tell you what's music, what's good, what's not good, all that stuff. Um, and then you have the mid tier. These are these kind of empowered bloggers, right? These are these guys who are, they're kind of up and coming. Um, they may be local to either neighborhood or local to city. But they're, but they're really out there, they really are a part of the scene, they're really like in the music, they're really into artists, and, and, they, and they're starting to get a good following. And then you have this bottom tier, these people who are really excited, really passionate, these are the people that like, you may have only been around for maybe three weeks, but these people are showing up at every single gig that you've had over those three weeks in your friend's backyard, because they love your music, um, their friends love their music, they're telling everyone about this, and these are the people that, that we really want to reach out to. You know, but typically, even in the business world, you're talking about this idea of, uh, you know, people aren't going to focus uh, on that mid-tier. Uh, they're usually focusing on these other areas that I'm crossing out here. And that's because, in a lot of cases, and even in the advertising world now, we're flipping this model on, on its head. And it's because we're finding out that these people who are more passionate, more connected, and more connected to you as artists, whether it's your friends, whether it's your friends of friends, these are the people who are going to be sharing your content. We were talking earlier about how you keep people engaged, how you interact with people online. And, and this is really where it all starts. It starts with reaching out to your fan base and reaching out to your friends. You're not really going to have access to, to these top level bloggers or anything like that as, as an emerging artist. If you're part of the label, yeah, sure. You're going to have PR people who will be out there and they'll be pitching your story and they'll be, they'll be doing all this stuff for you. But as an artist yourself, you have to think of yourself as a small business. And, and because of that, you're really, you're, you're a PR person, you're, you're a business person, you're everyone. Uh, this, sorry, this, just a quick story here. This actual photo is uh, a poster out of Facebook uh, in Menlo Park, and it's something that they have up in their office. And as weird as I think Facebook is, and as crazy of a place it is, they actually have some really inspiring things in their office. And uh, this is just something I look at every morning, actually, to help me kind of think about what, why I do what I do. And uh, so this, this next section really just talks about how, how you find these people. Uh, that was kind of kind of led off the conversation last time. Um, but the first thing really is, is finding your voice on social. You know who you are as an artist. You know who you are as a person. Um, the biggest thing that I see from a lot of people is that all of a sudden they come and they feel like, okay, this is going to be my presence. Uh, I have a friend who runs a uh, who runs a very small label in Seattle called the Balkan Records, and he's also in a group called the Mega Bats. And he is one of the funniest um, people I've ever met in my entire life. And you see that through him at work. You see that through him when he's on stage. You see that through him when he is uh, working with people at his label. And you see it uh, through him basically when he's talking with his friends. He's this person in every single aspect of what he does. And that also comes through through his social media. So if you look at their Twitter feed for their band or for his record label, uh, you, you can see it's him, you can tell it's his heart and soul in it. And when people are able to connect to a person rather than just this kind of ephemeral idea of a group or idea of a brand or product or anything like that, people are able to actually make a better connection with that. And they're more likely to share that information. They're more likely to be involved with it. And because of that, you know, we really see that this idea of having a presence you know, is a really good idea, but only if you have a purpose for your presence. So yeah, it's great to go out there, create your Twitter page, create your Facebook profile, uh, you know, snag Instagram while you're at it, uh, YouTube. This is just kind of a list, and you know, if you want to use this list as your checklist, that's great. Um, but you want to be in these places mostly because if someone does see you out at a gig and you know they, they don't have a friend to turn to and ask, you know, what, what group is that, or, or where can I find out more about these people, you want to actually be able to be found. Um, and these days, that involves coming up in Google.
so you know, having a presence on all these pages, I'm not saying you have to put a ton of content out there, but if you're able to at least set up these profiles, have a link that goes back to somewhere where you actually can update your information a lot more, um, that'll actually do you some good as well. And MySpace really is still really showing up uh, highly in search, so it's kind of interesting actually. And it, it, it worked for this guy. I hate Justin Bieber with compassion, but um, yeah, he really, <laughs> if you think about it, especially in North America, this guy, this kid at this point in time, had a YouTube page, sang a bunch of songs, and all of a sudden became this. Um, so you know, maybe, maybe that means that social media isn't always good, they kind of enabled this to happen, but it, it, it's this real story of this little tiny kid who had a major set of pipes and, uh, and weird pants now. But uh, you know, and that, that was all really open to social media. The second part is actually listening. Um, one of the things that I really got my friends in Seattle doing after their gig was going on Twitter, uh, putting in the name of their band, and just seeing who was talking about them after that gig. Uh, it's really easy to do, and you know, maybe it's five people, maybe it's 20 people, maybe it's 100 people. But if you're able to better connect with someone that really connected with you as, a, as an artist, after that experience, it, it's really interesting, actually. Um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more, but you can also find out you know, stuff about maybe the venues that you play in a lot. Put the venue uh, in a search, see what people are saying about the different bands that played there, see what people are saying about the artists, kind of get a feel for what kind of people go there, that sort of thing. And that, that's seriously really easy to do. And, uh, you know, it's not incredibly vain to Google yourself or Google your group all the time. It's actually something that, uh, that most people do. Yeah? All right. Hey, uh, there's something called Google Alerts, which you can set up. I don't know if people know about this. Uh, Google Alerts. And then you just put in a keyword and you'll get an email every day uh, telling you. So you can put in uh, your band name. And then whenever anyone mentions it anywhere online, you'll get an email about it. So. Totally. Yeah, so I mean, you can do the same thing. You can uh, do it on Google Alerts. You get your email every day. Uh, a lot of times that takes a couple days to pull stuff in. But, you know, like, like I said, my buddies are really, they would get really jacked up after, after a gig. They'd be like, man, that was awesome. The crowd really loved us tonight. They go online and, and try to find these people, who, usually 15 year old girls who like them because they were, that was their demo. But yeah, the, and, and then they were able to actually talk to these people and have those conversations. But yeah, like pulling stuff in through Google Alerts as well. Uh, Instagram, as, as people are like using more and more video and using photos as well, it's a great, great place to find people, uh, especially for your demo, might be a little bit younger. And then YouTube as well, people are taking video, that scary, scary video of you. But you know, really just use what's available out there. There, there are tons of paid products and people try to get you to pay for some sort of monitoring service or something like that. And a lot of time, honestly, you can do a better job yourself because you know your fans, you know what they're talking about, and you, and you know uh, you as a, as a person. And the second part of this has nothing to do with alpacas other than they will start with the A, is act. And that's, that's not engaging with your fans. Like I said, after, after the gig, go out there and talk with people face to face, but then when you have a chance to talk in the digital space, do that as well. It, it's really an extension and, and it can take you a lot further. Um, there's an artist who came out of Seattle called Macklemore, he's kind of big now. Um, but luckily, I, I don't want to be too much of a hipster, but I got to see him back when he was playing gigs with like 20 people in the basement of the club in Seattle. And the guy was the same person back then that he is now, which is actually incredible if you think about it. But this guy still to this day will talk to people on Twitter after shows, talk to people during the day, um, just reach out to people, connect with people, and all of a sudden you start getting these people in your corner. And, and that becomes really important um, if you actually see it. On this next one. Yeah, so talking about giving people that look inside. I think, uh, I think it was you actually was talking about sharing different pieces of your life, um, not necessarily uh, just your music, right? It was sharing, like fishing, uh, sharing that sort of stuff. And then, and then you as well with your, uh, your images, with the song lyrics, and you would just post that stuff as well. You know, this is that stuff that is, it's you as an artist, it's, it's, it's you as a person. And when you start putting those two things together, it starts engaging people a lot more. So giving people that look behind the scenes uh, becomes really important. Uh, again, I don't, I don't want to stack this with Seattle artists, but 
uh, Macklemore did shoot a video in Seattle a couple weeks ago, um, and they used a very, very small account, this broadcast coffee account, which is a friend of a friend of a friend, sent this tweet out, told people, hey, something's going on up on Capitol Hill, which is the area of Seattle, they're going to shoot a video. And then all of a sudden, literally that night, they had to turn people away off the street. This is a gigantic street. And they had to turn people away. They had over 40,000 people show up just to have their hands be in this music video. Um, pretty incredible, but it just kind of shows that you can use your influence, you can use the influence of your fans to really push people along. And, that, and that's all about just sharing something with them. That Everyone likes to be first to know something. So being able to just give someone the idea that maybe they're getting to see something behind the scenes, or maybe they're getting to see something before somebody else, uh, is a real kind of motivator in the, in the space of the big world. Cool. Last thing is have fun. Um, you know, maybe, I'm guessing you probably don't create music because you want to be rich, but you know, that's, we're all going to be rich someday, right? We hope. But uh, you know, just have fun with what you do. Have fun with your fans, and, and don't, if you start treating it, like it's something you have to just kind of check every day, you're going to start doing it less and less, and you're going to start doing it with less enthusiasm. But if you think, um, when you go out there and you're looking for your influential online, you're looking for your fans online, you're interacting with them, if you think that is the same exact thing as walking off stage after a gig and shaking someone's hand, or walking off stage after a gig and thanking someone for showing up at your show, that's where like you start to come out. And that's where you start to have these connections. Um, I've just got one more thing. And I, I'm gonna apologize for this right away, but it's screw the haters, man. Like, if, if you can't, if you can't get past that, <laughs> you're gonna have a really hard time. Uh, I, I can say I, I have not played in a band live in probably 10 years, um, and a lot of that goes to the fact that I'm definitely afraid of it. And I'm definitely afraid of standing up here in front of you right now as well. But uh, you know. At that point in time in my life, I didn't create music for anyone else. I was doing it for myself, I was doing it for my friends, and the like five girlfriends that I, ex-girlfriends I wrote music about at that point in time, I guess, you know? But um, if you, you have so many people out there who are going to support you, your friends, your family, and then all these people that you're gonna be able to find. Um, you don't have time for these people. Don't worry about that. Um, I can say anyone from my friends who are still in bands, all the way up to the largest brands that I've ever worked with, uh, around the world. There are always people who are not going to like what you're doing, or always people who are going to think they know how to do it better. And if you can just tell those people to piss off and, uh, and focus on you and focus on and getting your message out there, uh, that, that's all the better. So that's, that's all I've got for you guys right now. Um, definitely, uh, if you have any questions, if you don't want to ask me now, get that. Uh, always feel free to add me on Twitter, or uh, my, my email will probably be up on the site, I would guess. Uh, Tommy would put it up there. Um, but th this world of, of influence, and especially digitally, it just keeps evolving. And um, you know, I, I really just kind of push you guys to, to think about how you can further yourselves in, in terms of a brand, or in terms of this idea of being a business, and, and push yourselves out there. And uh, good luck to all of you. Thanks for coming. All right, are there any questions? So, yeah, whatever you have to say, you have to say it now, so we can start the discussion with a, with a brilliant gentleman. Hi, thanks a lot for this. Uh, my question is, it's a kind of a hypothetical one, but uh, do you think, uh, especially like, because again, as it was said before, we've got kind of the like capacity to have access to a fan base and be in control of what we do and what we, decide to put out, you know, obviously the more we do it, there might be patterns emerging in a sense of what kind of people you tend to appeal on and what kind of age range, you know what I mean? So do you think that might kind of uh, affect the way artists write music in a sense, like what they choose, how they choose to write and why they choose to write about because they get that certain amount of feedback on, on their social kind of media and stuff? I think it might, but at the end of the day, like, I think you have to be true to yourself in, in what you're doing, right? Like, uh, when I write music, my friends write music, you write music that comes from inside you, and, and if other people don't like that, 
you know, if your goal is to sell a million gold records, then that really shouldn't matter to you, I think. But, you know, I, I, I don't think that taking constructive criticism from anyone is bad or taking direction. Um, I can say, my, my friend's band's in Seattle, right? Like I said they had a bunch of 15-year-old girls at their concerts, and it's totally true. If you see, like, the progression of their music from, I would say, like, 2009, when they used to be called Most Versatile Boy, to, uh, which was named after an old trophy that they had, um, to you know, 2011 when they were uh, Sunderland, which is a softer name, they, they also had a softer sound, and then, you know, it, it definitely appealed to their audience a little bit more because I think they'd like to have the girls screaming at them at the end of the day. But, you know, I, whether I could say, you know, I, I, don't, I think you could ask 20 people here, they might have different questions or different answers to that. But I don't think it's bad to be able to use social, use digital to be able to get feedback on, on your shows or anything like that. Hi, um, thanks for that one, I really enjoyed it. Um, my question was about your influence pyramid. Um, and I was just wondering, you were saying about flipping it on its head. Um, does that mean um, when you're starting out, you encouraging um, emerging artists just to try and get their fans excited to get into bloggers, or do you think contacting um, bloggers is a good thing to do? So I would say, like, you definitely want to start with your friends and family. Like, the more kind of momentum you have behind you, the more you're able to, like, I guess my thing is, so, Uh, you know, if you have your friends or family behind you, have your like strong hardcore fans behind you at the beginning. Um, when you actually start to reach out to bloggers and stuff like that, you have a little bit more kind of social capital behind you, right? Um, all of a sudden, when they throw your name into Google and they don't know who you are, they're going to see that there are other people talking about you and that sort of stuff. So that's why that's why I kind of talk about this idea of flipping it on its head. Um, I definitely think that's important as well. You know, um, as you start to grow and as you start to uh, you know, have more things to say and more things to share. I, I think reaching out to those kind of mid-tier bloggers is definitely something you can do. And, and again, you probably don't have to employ someone to do that for you at the beginning. Um, all my girlfriends would get mad at me for saying that, but you, you really don't. At, at the end of the day, like you're, you're the artist, you're your you're music, uh, and you're going to be able to better tell that story, whether it's or whether it's just someone just walking down the street. I'm asking about grunge music. I'm from Seattle. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I don't know. That was before my time, actually. Okay, I have a question. So this is what I'm thinking about all the time. Basically, this is what I wanted you to answer to me, and this is why I got you here. So you get an answer. So it's all about connecting the dots. Okay. So you start first of all leveraging your own influence. You influence the people that are passionate about what you do then maybe through this influence you try to reach more high profile bloggers and then you go to the end of the pyramid. How do you spot who you're contacting next? And how do you do this? <coughs> so I work in the digital space, so I always, I always think digitally. Um, the internet is a great wealth of information. A lot of times you can actually get lost in a lot of it, but um, one of the great things, I, I'm surprised I, I forgot to touch on it, but it was actually connecting with other artists. Um, and connecting with other bands and stuff like that because at the end of the day like those people are going to be able to help open doors for you as well um, There are a lot of great artists who may be a couple steps ahead of you in, in their progress and in, in their history And those people are always willing to help out uh, not, I'm not going to say always, but a lot of those artists are willing to help people out because they came up the same way uh, That other artists do and so being able to use those people to find those connections uh, so then also, you know, like I said, using digital, being able to find out what blogs people are reading, uh, that sort of stuff. If you want to get really black hat about it, you can, you know, when you actually start finding the people who are talking about you, uh, you can go look on their profile, find out who they're following. That's a good indication of maybe what publications they're reading, what sites they're visiting, that sort of stuff as well. So then you know that that's kind of your next step uh, after you get these people behind you. Okay, so it does make sense. The way that I'm trying to work things out is first of all, see who I want to reach out to. Then I, I try to think whether this is realistic or not. If it's not, I'm good at judging this. Sometimes I get rejected, but most of the times they say, all right, you know, because I was quite realistic. And then I try to find somebody who they might know or they're connected with, and then somebody this person is connected with that I can reach out to, depending how easy it is. 
and, and this is the way that I'm working out. If I see something is missing, I'm trying to build this. So I can be able to give something to that, to that person and then reach out to the other person. And I don't know whether you agree with this or... No, I, mean, I definitely agree with it. I think there needs to be kind of like a more cemented version of, um, you want to call it LinkedIn for artists, right? Like it, it's this idea about connecting people with other people. There's bits, bits and pieces of it on things like pure volume, SoundCloud, stuff like that. But you know, it's not quite connected up to maybe that next level where it's these people that they need to be talking with to get the information out there. Um, so if you want to build that, go ahead. I get half that. <laughs> people furthest from him always raise their hand. Hi. My question basically is about um, the EU, I mean, you'll come from um, America, and for, for a local artist from the UK who wants to actually reach out to, say, you know, other countries in Europe or the US um, through social networking, obviously, um, we're here and they're over there, we're not going there right now. What do you think the best way to actually influence another country from here? I think maybe the best way would actually be to start reaching out through similar artists to yourselves, you know, start connecting with those people. Someone earlier talked about collaboration. Uh, doing that sort of stuff. Who was that that said that? That was a great idea. Bonus points for you. Um, you know, that's a great way to do it, actually. Um, and then you kind of keep your name up there a little bit. You're able to use those people. Maybe you crash on their couch the first time you go over to the States, right? And making those connections with people, I think, is really important. Uh, I was talking with, I believe they left two, uh, two ladies earlier, actually, about um, some of their videos are doing really well in Germany. And it's something you can tell on YouTube, right? You can see where the videos are uh, geographically. Some of their videos are doing really well in Germany and they're trying to think, how do we make that leap? How do we get over there? How do we actually get over there, meet these people, get some gigs going, actually get paid for going over there at the same time? Um, yeah, so, so I think the, the chances are definitely there. And I think it all starts again with relationships. Um, and I think probably artist to artist is probably one of the easier ways to do that in the beginning. Thank you. Here's the microphone. Are there any questions? Yes. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, one other thing I was going to say, um, since I am new to London, I have not gotten into the local music scene that much at all. So if you guys want to send me any of the tracks or anything, do it on Twitter. I'll definitely give it a listen. And uh, I look forward to getting more into the London music scene. So. Cool. Thanks, guys. Right. So basically some people know what this is all about, some people the first time. My vision for Dark Music Talks is over time to create the biggest e-library of knowledge, of free knowledge for people to just type social, find social media, social influence, social this and that, or whatever they might need. So attending to those things is going to be part of a bigger vision. I'm not going to stop. I want this thing to evolve through you. So, however you might want to help, the easiest way is to tell a friend. And the next one is going to be in a month. You will receive an email, and we'll start from there. So, thank you very much for being here. I'm